Yes. Okay, friends, let's start then and uh, welcome once again from on behalf of all the panelists, I would say not just from CSC. We are very happy to host this uh, second uh, of a series of discussions uh, on sanitation, which we have titled as Improved Sanitation Outcome Through Better Data and Planning. So this uh, webinar, I'll just give you, a, I'll start immediately and give you a brief catch up. So the webinar is part of this Policy and Practice Forum 2023 uh, follow-up. So we had a good round of uh, international, national practitioners and policymakers participate in this event in the end of April. And we are very happy that some need was felt of having an informal discussion series arising from there. And this need for informal discussion series is meant to serve a couple of purposes. One is a regular interaction and an open learning informal dialogue, which many participants in April express the need that there should be more open informal dialogue rather than very structured formal presentations and webinars and expanding the outreach and engagement. So the idea was to expand it as much as possible to uh, that alone will allow us to not only reach out to different uh, kinds of audience, but also on different topics and experiences. So learning and sharing of the work in progress and ideas, this is very important. Normally webinars and presentations are done to share some findings or completed work, but we believe that identifying emerging issues and topics is equally important identifying approaches and frameworks which are relevant to our work, developing basic conceptual clarity and forging collaborations. All this is possible if you have a platform where you can have an informal discussion. And, you know, formal discussions can follow up and, you know, we have face-to-face -face meetings. So this particular discussion has been curated by Pratima Joshi and Manasra, who brought up this idea that let's focus on data and planning. and uh, and we got in Ajit uh, to work on this, and we got Mona here and um, Jagan Shah, in addition, who could speak from the urban planning perspective. So this is how the webinar agenda is structured. I will be giving this uh, brief introduction and also sharing a few slides of the CSC work on informal slum settlements sanitation planning, which my colleague Umra will share. And then we have Pratima Joshi and Ajit sharing the practice, the work which they have done on informal settlements and, and using data to drive sanitation delivery, uh, both in informal settlements as well as the formal master planning of a sewerage scheme for a Pune city. Uh, Rohit Kakkar will present the perspective of CPHEO and um, and the work which they are doing and how the what is the importance they believe of planning and data and followed by Mona Ayer, uh, Professor Mona Ayer from SEP University, where she is uh, prepared presenting on urban planning perspective and pedagogy on both aspects. And Manusrat would and Jagan Shah would more or less, you know, complete this uh, summing up part. So we wanted to do in this in a collaborative spirit. And then we will have two rounds of open discussion. One we thought we will have after the first two presentations and one we will have at the end. And therefore, we have this kind of a registration for this webinar. As you can see, a lot of it is from India and Africa. And we have some participants from other continents, but more than 500 registrations we have. Um, there are these basic ground rules I don't need to repeat, but we will have discussions where we will ask you to raise your hand and you know submit your questions. These are the speakers and their profile I will go through one by one. Mr. Professor Pratap Rawal had joined, but uh, he had to go, so we had to drop him. And Pratima Joshi is the executive director at Shelter Associates, 
she'll be the first speaker and how they have done uh, uh, slum level improvement, both of toilets as well as connectivity of their toilets to the uh, sewerage system. Uh, Mr. Ajit Oak is the director of Primo, and he has great experience in working on engineering solutions. And in the last seven years, he's been leading the development and commercialization of Tiger Toilet, Biofilter, and FSTP technologies in India and abroad. Uh, Mr. Rohit Kakkar is the deputy advisor at CPHEO. He brings the complements, the technology aspect of designing and planning at CPHEO. And he has been, along with Mr. Torosia, a, a great contributor to our uh, sessions and webinars. Professor Mona Iyer is the dean and faculty of planning and architecture, uh, and, and, and she has over 24 years of experience. She's one of the very enthusiastic and um, respected uh, professor at SEPT University and has been engaged with various uh, programs and activities, uh, both academic and practice side of urban planning and sanitation. Manusrat is a senior advisor at Borda Femen South Asia, and he has he's also leading as a co-founder of the Sleep Cities. And uh, he has been active in various forums and has a good understanding of the issues and challenges in urban sanitation. Jagan Shah is a resident fellow at Earth Global, and he has held various positions in, in the national government as well as uh, with, the, uh, with DFID and other institutes. He was also heading NIUA and also the director of school and uh, of school of art and architecture um, of sushant school so he he brings in his ability to combine the urbanization planning aspects into the sanitation dialogue and we asked him to do the summing up at the end of it. so i will not go through these uh, slides on the csc water program because this is a webinar meant for other topics so i will just skip this so that when we share this you know presentation then others can just know briefly about the csc work now i'll ask my colleague uh, umra to just share this issue of the current research we are doing on transformation of on-site system, sanitation systems and um, umra if you can just take over and these are just four slides so this gives a good background of this topic why data is important because we are just starting this and we thought we might as well present it as an introduction. Over to you. Yes, thank you so much. Sir. So this is a study which we have just initiated last month itself. So can you just, yeah. So um, Sangam, we, have, we selected Sangam we have for a study because it is said to be one of the largest unauthorized colony in Asia. It is It has uh, an approximate area of seven square kilometer. So when we started working in the area, the first issue that we found was of data. We were not even able to get the population, the area, or any any information about the area, not even the complete map of the area. So uh, through some digging, we got uh, just the this few numbers that the election commission has given us that in 2020, the population of the um, area of like the registered voters were around 7.8.5 uh, lakhs. But this is also uh, 2020 data and we don't have anything else uh, as of now. Also, uh, in Sangam Vihar, one of the issues that we um, actually saw, uh, which is why we actually went to Sangam Vihar, was that even if it rains for like around two to three hours, this is actually the situation in most of the part of uh, Sangam Vihar. So can you skip to the next one? Yeah, thank you. So... Uh, when we were researching, we got into a plan that uh, we actually got this information from DJB that they are planning to lay down 757 kilometer of sewer lines in author unauthorized colonies of Delhi, uh, out of which to, uh, 25 kilometers was uh, supposed to be uh, done in uh, 11 unauthorized colonies of Sangam Bihar. Uh, but this information was of 2023, but when we went to the ground, we actually saw that uh, in 2021 itself, five colonies uh, did have the uh, lines already present. So we came on, uh, so we actually decided to actually see um, 
what is the current situation in such informal settlements such huge densely uh, populated informal settlements uh, and try to come up with some uh, like inclusive ways in which the water and sanitation in uh, these type of uh, huge colonies can be uh, improved so next slide yeah so at present as i informed there is a uh, lack of data and we uh, don't have um, much information of the area so we just try to understand the area by roughly just uh, draft, uh, roughly just uh, sketching the uh, all the blocks of the area so we find out that there are 13 blocks in the area but as per djp they say that there are 16 uh, blocks in the area so there is a gap there which we are trying to uh, verify these numbers as of now and briefly if we see the situation at present in some of the blocks of the area that we've um, find out through our recce is that the water situation there are four different type of water uh, sources available in Sangam Bihar as it is a huge area so the situation here might not be same here so for example we have a borewell um, present there we uh, there is a Sonia Bihar pipeline that uh, supplies water in the area and then there are few areas where they don't have any access to water there, there we actually send tankers and uh, water bottles also, we got to know that there is some uh, water mafia in the area where uh, some private, some powerful person has taken up um, the water supply from one of the areas and he's selling it to the residents. And this is basically the ongoing project that DJB has uh, proposed in 2020 that um, they'll be laying down 25 kilometers of civil line. So these is just some of the glimpses. And because of that, what's happening is the pipe water pipeline is being disrupted in some of the areas, which you can see here. So that is one of the uh, one of our observations. And this is basically the scenario in areas where there are no sewer lines. So basically, if you can see, um, there was a, there there are septic tanks in the houses, but there are they are, they are basically like uh, deep holding tanks, and there are no basic outlets. And the grey water is going directly in the open drain. And if you see, uh, we actually surveyed one of the one or few of the households. And this is uh, the scenario in one of the households where the septic tank is basically um, just adjacent to the cooking and the drinking water area of the house. And uh, the scenario in this house was that uh, the desludging was not done in the house for around seven to ten years. So I don't know what is the situation in the entire Sangam Vihar uh, area, but this is of situation of one of the households there, and. Uh, so in five colonies there were civil lines uh, laid so this is the situation there where uh, so we found out from the people that um, the black water from the house is being transferred to the main central line so some of the houses have disconnected the use of septic tanks in the area and also um, we found out that uh, in the late fever lines there is a problem of choking that is uh, being faced also uh, this is something new that we found out that uh, what people have done is uh, they are mixing the storm water uh, with the sewage uh, by creating these uh, little holes uh, around the manhole so this is basically the situation in sangam vihar and today with the webinar we are trying to understand how should we go about the study and what actually can be done in such areas or yeah so sir if you would like to add anything no, no, I don't want to add anything. Let's straight away get down to uh, the presentations from our panelists. And I would request Pratima to please start her presentation. Thank you, Pratima. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are. Oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah, all right. So um, thank you very much, Dipinder. Um, uh, this uh, webinar was Pratima, really inspired by those uh, three days. Pratima, can I interrupt you? Sorry very much. Yeah. But on my screen, your slide is uh, sort of not fitting in the screen. It's it's uh, going out. Is it? Of, uh, yeah. Okay. Could you just zoom out a little bit oh. or fit, fit the screen or something? Is that better? Yeah, I think that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, great. Thanks a lot. Um, so, Dipinder, I would like to start by thanking you because you're the one who really inspired this webinar and uh, this whole topic. And of course, Manas, uh, you've always been a great uh, support when it comes to data. Um, right at the outset, I would like to say that I'm going to really focus on how 
we have leveraged data to try and work out solutions with urban local bodies um you know across some of the cities that we've been working in we are not really experts in the in the sanitation technology aspect of it like fssm or uh, you know the other technologies that have been but collaboratively we have learned that as we use uh, le leverage data there 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 are immense possibilities and i just thought let me just share uh, with uh, you know two examples examples of two cities where we have been working pretty intensively the last few years um through this very data uh, driven community centric approach so um uh, okay so uh, just briefly to let you know that um, we have been working largely in the state of maharashtra we worked in about seven cities uh, where we have captured data across slums um uh, across the cities so there are some cities where we've done 100% data and that's why i've chosen navi mumbai and uh, kolhapur as our two case studies because these are two cities where we've uh, mapped every settlement mapped every house collected data for every house we've mapped the infrastructure so we've got two sets of uh, uh, you know data that we integrate on the gis platform one is at the household level and one is at the infrastructure level and the infrastructure level data really captures the existing sewer line existing water uh, solid waste management systems that are uh, that are in place and the household data sort of in a way uh, runs the same kind of questions to understand whether people have a home toilet or whether they're using common toilet blocks or whether they're defecating in the open what kind of water uh, systems are there um, you know at the household level whether they, they have their own water uh, connection or they are dependent on a, a shared connection or a water stand post or something else so um, uh, and and of course the the solid waste management part of it so we try and capture the, this, this this kind of a data set in a rapid household appraisal from every house in a settlement um so if you look at if you if you look at navi mumbai navi mumbai has um, six major wards um and uh, uh, 56360 households have been mapped across 57 slums uh we've also started digital addressing so that you know they have addresses which are navigable on google maps uh, 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 the houses where we've given them di digital addresses and um we have facilitated close to 4000 uh, home toilets uh, of uh, you know of which out, out of 3941 to be very precise 3092 have been connected to the main sewer networks and we directly been able to in, impact about 15 and a half thousand people um, uh, in, in the city so if the, if you look at the map you will find that uh, you know across the wards how many toilets we have facilitated so um um gansoli is one of the wards where we've done um, a fair number like 887 households have received a toilet airoli has 1376 and so on okay so wherever you are yeah wherever you are using this term drainage it's actually sewerage isn't that Yes, yes. It's actually a sewage line. That's right. You're right. Okay. I just thought it, this is an interesting slide to show what is the percentage breakup of slum population in in the six wards that we are uh, or eight wards that we are looking at, um, and what has been really our intervention. So Vashi has absolutely no slum. Nehrul uh, and Belapur also have very small percentages, like two percent uh, each. Uh, but Digha has ninety percent of the population of digha is in slums um turbhe ward has about 29% which is in slum so if you if you look at this and then you try and correlate it to what has been the impact in these particular wards it's very interesting to see for instance digha is the most neglected ward uh, within navi mumbai where where sanitation is concerned uh, it's it's been least service also um so th this this kind of gave us a good idea of you know where we really need to focus now um if 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 we've given a sort of a break up of um, uh, you know the the households across these wards to to help people understand 
um, how many people have, what's the percentage that has access to a home toilet? So it's only 32%. There are only 15,630 families who have access to a home toilet, whereas you have almost 68%, that is 37,000 families who are yet to get a toilet at home. So this is at the city level that we've got this data uh, for all the slums. Now, um, I, I want to say that Navi Mumbai uh, basically has uh, land which belongs to you know other government bodies also. So it has jurisdiction over land which also belongs to say the MIDC or uh, the, the you know the forest land. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult to get data from the other uh, you know government departments regarding what is the kind of sewerage. Uh, uh, you know, networks that are available across the city because we wanted to really look at that and then sort of see the slums in context to see what were the possibilities that arise. So all the blue things that you see are all uh, the NMMC land. What, what you see is the in the green belt is all forest land. And what you see in the pink one is all the MIDC land. But luckily for us, uh, the MIDC also shared its um, you know, uh, sewer network data with us. So we've been able to plot both the NMMC and the MIDC and kind of take a look at what's happening. And, and in the table, you see what is the breakup of slums vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the, the, uh, the land ownership, because that also plays an extremely important role when it comes to making decisions. Okay. Um, so the next one is um, um, this map also kind of clearly shows um, where are the proposed treatment plants, where are the existing sewer treatment plants. There's a legend below. This is just really to help you all understand what is the kind of uh, sewerage and STPs uh, break up across the cities. Um, and and uh, all the pinks that you see are the slums that are across. Now, I'm just going to focus on two or three words just to help you understand uh, how we have gone about it. So let me start with Belapur. Now, Belapur luckily has all the land uh, which is which belongs to the Navi Mumbai uh, you know, Municipal Corporation. Um, so I, when I mean Navi Mumbai Municipal Corporation, it is under their jurisdiction. Um, there, there are only five slums. So uh, you have five slums and about uh, a, a thousand... Uh, uh, hundred families which are living in these five slums and the occupied are about 1055. Uh, he, in, in these five slums, we've, we, uh, we have achieved like toilet coverage of 69%. So there are 724 households who have a home toilet of which a shelter alone has contributed 581, which is 80% of, of the 69% that you see. Drainage coverage is also pretty good at 81%. And uh, you have that many community toilet blocks. Uh, many of them, you know, uh, because we were able to give a home toilet to so many houses, the toilet to person ratio came down drastically. So you have one seat for 14 people. So roughly about um, three to four, two, three to four families. Uh, to, to help you understand how we, how we did this, um, look at these two particular, you know, one is Ramabai and uh, one is Sambhaji Nagar, and they are both along uh, the gentle slopes, um, hill slopes. Uh, there is a nala which, um, which runs alongside, and the drainage networks were actually on the other side of the nala. The, uh, the blue lines that you see are all the new drainage lines with the, which the municipal corporation invested in. So when we did the surveys, and we found most of the people were using community toilet blocks, which you can see in red, which were really, at, uh, especially in Ramamata, it was right at the base of that hill. So a lot of people would defecate in the open, the people on top who did not want to come all the way down to use the community toilet. Because the slopes were good and it was possible to lay uh, drainage networks, we uh, uh, sort of uh, had intensive discussions uh, with the engineers of, the, of, of that ward. They came and did a, a, a survey. They validated our data. And in due course, they invested in laying drainage networks. So you see a lot of networks that were laid and then connected to the existing sewer network, which was across the Nala. So can you see at certain junctions, you know, they have crossed through the Nala to be able to connect to the network on the other side. 
which suddenly opened up the possibility for almost all the families to take a home toilet. So in the map, if you see, the blue ones are the ones who are yet to take a home toilet, which is a very small percentage. But the pink ones are the ones who all got a, a, a toilet at home now. Um, similarly, Iroli Ward, there are two huge slums over there. You have um, uh, 16,000 odd families who live in Iroli Ward. And only 35% of the families here have a home toilet of which, I mean, there are 5,020 families who have a toilet at home and shelter has contributed about 1,376 toilets. Today, if you see the toilet to person ratio there in community toilet blocks, um, it's one is to 68. So for every seat, there are 68 people who are using it, which is not at all a desirable uh, situation. But we looked at two large settlements. Uh, one is Chinspada and the other is Yadavnagar. In fact, 55% of um, Airori's um, slum population is within these two slum pockets. Now, Yadavnagar, which is on the right, is, uh, is, is a slum where we haven't made an intervention. But Chinspada is the settlement where we have actually worked. We found that the municipal corporation was very keen to... Uh, uh, you know, um, to, lay, to, to give them a toilet at home. And they were planning on having a, a huge biogas plant. Uh, they, they, they had a, a proposed biogas plant over there uh, for, uh, you know, two MLD capacity. So then we said, if, if we take this up, they said we start laying the drainage networks, which we can then connect to the biogas plant. And they started doing that. So all the blue lines that you see are the ones which have been laid under Swachh Bharat Abhyan. And on the right, it's work in progress. Actually, they have laid a lot of networks there, um, leveraging the data. And they've shown um, the, the the blue on top you see is a proposed STP, which they want to uh, you know sort of uh, build in, in, in the next uh, couple of years. Now, this is how they were sort of planning with the data that we've given. Now, if you see the actual impact on Chinspara, what has happened is that all the green and all the pink houses that you see have a toilet. But there is a, a circle which you see on top. Uh, there, there are quite a few blue families there who still don't have a toilet because there's a gradient issue over there. So uh, more recently, when we've been talking to the, uh, uh, the ward and, and the city engineer, who's also extremely involved in this particular project, um, he's, he said that we will now get a pumping station there from where we can pump the sewage and bring it to the biogas plant because right now it is working well under capacity. We have been able to connect only barely two and a half thousand families to the, to the biogas plant which they've installed just two years ago and it can still take an additional two and a half thousand uh, families you know, connected. So now those 700 families which are getting left out uh, will eventually get connected here and they are going to start the process of laying the lines over there. So this is the way they have been engaging with us on a very, very regular basis and, and planning these things out. And tomorrow when the STP gets built across the road, then maybe they will think of how they can shorten that distance and uh, instead of pumping it to that great distance, they might just be able to show it, uh, you know, uh, do a shorter distance and connect it, to, connect it to the STP plan. Now, this is not the, uh, I mean, uh, this, this is a compromise solution in a way because the effluent from the biogas is then going into a nala, which is very close by. So it is not a 100% treatment, but eventually they are, moving in that direction by trying and installing an STP plant, which will be in a vicinity where eventually all the sewage will get led. Pratima, uh, if you can I'll... include now, please, otherwise we'll run out. Pardon? If you can conclude then in the next two minutes, then you know, we'll run out of time. Oh, okay. Uh, am I already running out of time? Okay, I just thought I'll give you one more example. Now, Turbe store is the largest slum in the in, in the city. And uh, we are currently working in it. And, and there was a dictat from the ward saying that please don't give toilets to people who are beyond 25 meters. So if you see that map on the left, it has all the yellow houses. Those were the only ones who had the possibility of getting a toilet at home. And a huge percentage was getting left out simply because they did not have the technology for desludging. So what we did was we started having dialogue with them. And finally, we, uh, you know, they came across the solution where Kam Avida 
has these sludging capacities which can get ex extended to anywhere between 60 to 100 meters. So if you look at this map now on the right, you'll say, see that very few houses get left out, but most of them now can be, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, desludged using that, you know, this technology. So there are already talks in uh, with Kamavida to acquire a, a, a desludging uh, truck from them. So, so th this is the other way that, you know, so we are doing this ward by ward. We have a lot of meetings. As you can see on the right, we, we have regular um, site visits by their engineers and looking at every slum and what can be the possibility. So it can be right now we are trying to do a work, uh, you know, take up a slum in uh, the forest land where a decentralized sewage treatment plant is a possibility. You know, wherever possible is a pumping station or group septic tank. So um, these are the various solutions. So there's no one glove fits all happening here. It is all a, a range of options that are being tried out. But this is possible only now because there's so much very granular data available. And I'll just take a minute, Dipinda, because this is not going to take too long. Kolapur has been also a very win-win situation. Uh, considering the fact that parts of Kolapur has no drainage networks at all, I mean, even for the, the rest of the city, not just slum, we have been still able to move the needle from barely 26% to now 62% families having uh, their own toilets. Um, it, it, it's a tier two city. Um, there are about, um, you know, today we have uh, 8,641 toilets, um, families having their own toilet, which I mean, the as I said, 66% of the families have a toilet. All the red ones that you see are, are out of 57, 34 ones, uh, 34 slums where we've done intervention have all got over 70% of toilet coverage, uh, home toilet coverage. Uh, I'm rushing through this a bit. I'll be sharing the slides. People can go through it and then ask me questions later on. Um, uh, you can mail mail them to me. But I want to say even here, we've had a whole combination. In some places where biogas was a feasibility, we did biogas. Wherever we we felt septic tanks, modified septic tanks, because, you know, narrow lanes, very difficult to take um, uh, sometimes material or even a prefab septic tank, which can be pretty big, you know, eight feet wide, which cannot be taken in. We've actually gone through uh, modified septic tanks where you break it down into a, into smaller units and, and then you lay them under the, uh, under the house um, and connect the toilet to it. So we have done a whole range of options here. So some are drainage connected. Again, here also the city invested in drainage network. Uh, this is the largest slum uh, in um, um, uh, Rajendra Nagar in Kolhapur. And what we found, the water data threw up was something very interesting. We found that actually there were a lot of sewer networks which had already been laid, but there was a last mile connection which was which had not been done. So people couldn't take a home toilet. Once this data came alive, they actually invested in that last mile connection and connected it to the city sewer network, which was just a, a little away from the settlement. And suddenly, you know, we, we had, uh, uh, you know, al almost uh, seven, eight hundred families getting a, a home toilet uh, in, in their house. Um, so, so these are some examples. In, in this particular case, we've got the entire settlement connected to a biogas plant, which today there's a rehabilitation project that's going to happen here under Prime Minister Davas Yojana, and they're going to use that biogas then for uh, treating solid waste, uh, the wet waste. So this is how uh, I feel a date. This is my last slide, Dipinder. Uh, I feel a data-driven approach um, really helps you to you know, uh, look at things, the granular data, look at, you know, the both from the worm's eye perspective and the bird's eye perspective, you get so much clarity that then that's done driving the kind of decision, the kind of possibilities, even technologically what is possible is something that you can then really, um, you know, uh, work around it with all the engineers and, and the government is then willing to engage with, uh, with, with these kind of processes and come out with the solutions which can be either very long term or intermediate or maybe you know maybe short term but which can then later be translated into something which is more permanent i'll just stop there <laughs> thank you pratima and thanks for sharing uh, this experience which is rich in terms of the fact that so many interventions were done in different parts and from sewage to FSTP, biogas, modified septic tanks, pump stations, you know, everything you tried out in different locations, which is great. Uh, 
So, uh, and a lot of some questions are there marked for in the Q&A. If you can, you know, answer there. And uh, I would request now Ajit uh, from Primo, to please, uh, if you can come up and share your presentation while, you know, uh, Pratima can answer the questions which are raised in the chat. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and share my screen if that's okay. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I hope uh, you all can see my screen. Yes, sir, you can see. Okay. Uh, let me just go to slideshow. Yeah. Somehow, if I, when I go to slideshow, It's disappeared now. You're on mute, Ajit. Can you see my screen now? No, no, it's gone off. Oh, okay. Share him over screen one. Yeah, can you see it now? Yes. Okay, super. I'm just trying to get on the slideshow. Okay. Uh, I think I have switched on slideshow. I don't know whether it's it's visible there. No, it's coming otherwise, but uh, it's I don't know what to do. But... Just give me one second. Yeah. Anyway, so I think let's let's just proceed with this if it's okay with you. Ajit, you could try just one other thing, which is first go into slideshow view and then yeah. share your screen on Zoom. Okay. Then press so the stop sharing screen. now. Okay, first go into slideshow view on your computer and then press okay. yeah, share I'll screen on Zoom. Resume. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. I thought it might work. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Nope. Aha. Uh -huh. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see it. But it's not on slideshow, right? No. Uh, unfortunate. I'll just maybe zoom it a little bit. Okay? Yeah. That's yeah, so basically, uh, what I'm going to do is share a project that we've done with the Pune Municipal Corporation. Uh, this was preparation of master plan for CV scheme, but it involves a lot of uh, data collection and mapping of the sewer network, etc. So I think it's very uh, critical for this for the discussion that we are having right now. So uh, just I'll go through quickly. It's a long presentation, but I'll skip through the slides which are not important. And maybe I, what I wanted to show was some mapping in GIS that we have done, which we will see in a, in a moment. So basically, uh, what we've done was is to create an entire master plan of sewer network which was already existing in the city uh, and then uh, we have modeled it for various uh, scenarios for the next 40 years with considering different kind of population uh, growth and the different kind of growth of the city of course to that later on we also added some of the villages which were included in the municipal corporations so almost 34 villages were added subsequently which uh, initially the area of pune city was 200 around for 250 square kilometers it's now gone up to uh, almost 500 square kilometers, so twice the uh, twice the size now. So we started with 250, and then we over the last couple of years we've also expanded the, this uh, study to cover all the entire uh, the villages which are there. So we started. So this is basically looking at the entire network, entire city sewage network, treatment, pumping, everything, and then 
projecting it and modeling it, it, it for the future. So the start was, of course, preparation of a base map. So we had a georeferenced satellite image uh, at that time for, from 2014. We worked on this, I think, in 17, 18 initially. Now, of course, subsequently, we have later images also. And then we had the DGPS points, which is basically differential GPS points spread across the city, which, uh, which we used to... Uh, hang on. Just give me a second. I think something wrong again. Okay. Yeah, it's, like, it's back. Yeah. Is it back? But for, for I see so many screens. It is back, but the size is reduced now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, it bunk just stop sharing. Just let me just stop sharing. Sorry, and there's something terribly wrong. No problem. Sir, do you I'm want wrong. me to share the screen? I have your presentation. If uh yeah, but I have also have some other anyway. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that and we'll try and fix my screen in the meantime. Sure. Yeah, maybe I just say, huh? Okay. Hi, is it visible, sir? Okay, yeah. Then you can have the icon, then you see a key. Upon a garage spot. Can you be able to call me? Yeah. Can I start? Yes, sir, please. Yeah, okay. So uh yeah, let's let's go to the next slide. Next, next, next. Yeah, so uh yeah, this one. So uh image year 2014. So the green dots that you see, th these are basically DGPS points. Uh, differential GPS points, which basically link up the satellite image uh, with with a ground uh, point. So what we did was we used this and we linked up the entire topographic survey that we carried out to these DGP, DGPS points. So what this does is that it links everything with the satellite image. So all the points which are there that can be easily linked with the image and the, of course the ground uh, conditions as such. Can we have the next one? So then, uh, then we did the base map digitization of the entire city. So the, all this yellow that you see is basically roads, uh, some principal features, uh, STPs, everything. So this was digitized from the satellite image. So until until this point, uh, there was no actually physical survey. It was basically transferring all the uh, data which was on the satellite image onto a digitized CAD model. Next. Uh, then, based on this and based on the overall topography, uh, we demarcated the, what we call as the sewage district. So these are the areas that collect the sewage from different areas in the in the city and bring it to a central point where uh, sewage treatment plants are provided and uh, the sewage gets treated. Of course, Pune at that time or even now did not treat 100% of the sewage. It treats about I think 40 to 50% of the sewage that it. Generates, but anyway, the network-wise, it is in a fairly good shape. Uh, almost, I would say, 98 to 100 percent of the city is covered with uh, with a sewer network, which we wanted to document and uh, take the study forward. Next one, please. So this is just the network development process. We will uh, we will not wait here. We'll just move to the next slide so that I'll just explain you the process. Yeah. So. Uh, as I said, basically the uh, DGPS points, you can see these D43, D35, D36, these are the uh, uh, DGPS point, differential GPS points. And considering them as the benchmarks, we then carried out a uh, survey of the entire area of the uh, of the sewer network. Next one, please. Yeah, so... Uh, DGPS points, we of course had problems with them the way they were laid, but anyways, we, we had to overcome them and then uh, demarket them as the as the benchmarks. Next one. Yeah, so uh, then what we did was we, uh, we have documented all the manholes. So the red dots that you see, they are the manhole covers. So all them, all of them were picked up using survey equipment. Uh, and of course, they were linked to the DGPS points. So we had exact coordinates. So now uh, all the manholes in the city are mapped like this. They have been uh, coded, numbered, and then we did further study on them. I'll just uh, just go down. Next slide. 
yeah so we had a uh, sorry we, we had a coding system for each of the districts so now uh, they uh, every manhole can be identified uh, uh, and by, by just looking at the name you can know which sewage district it is which means that you know which uh, stp it is it, it is finally going to go to and what is the area that it is going to collect so you had a prefix with the name of the sewage district followed by the number of the uh, manhole next one so then we did a humongous exercise of opening up every manhole that could be opened in the city uh, and we measured the inward depths and we documented the pipelines, the, in, the incoming and the outgoing pipe from that chamber, its inward level, its condition, everything was documented and then put back on the, uh, on the map. So basically, uh, of course, this had to be done because the city did not have a comprehensive map of its uh, sewer network. It has developed through years. I think uh, the first uh, sewer network in uh, in Pune was way back uh, in the in the British time. So from that time on, slowly it has been uh, built up over a period of time. So all that had to be documented. I think, and that's the situation to for in almost every city in this country. I don't think there are sort of comprehensive maps available in most of the cities. So what this study has done is it has provided an entire network which has the including the inward levels, the depths, the pipe diameters, directions, whether clogged, not clogged, everything has been now documented. Next one. So uh, based on this topographic study and then the entire uh, network and the flow of uh, sewage, uh, we formed new sewage districts. So because uh, some areas were wrongly linked to you know uh, other uh, sewage district which was making the whole system inefficient so we remodeled the entire thing and formed uh, uh, 17 sewage districts uh, of, of the of the city now this also included fringe villages because fringe villages also were draining into the city pune being a city which is located in a sort of a bowl with uh, hills on all sides so all the fringe villages also drain inside the city and you can see uh, through the city run the two rivers which actually drain the entire city so the, all the sewage comes uh, and passes through the center of the city through this uh, through its network. Next one. Yeah, so this is just uh, sort of data on each of these sewage districts in, in terms of you know how much area it covers and all that. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, so uh, so in the process we documented about as you can see uh, in the old city network about one lakh thirteen thousand manholes. Out of that, about four thousand five hundred odd, odd were in the Nala. 1200 when in the river. So about 1 lakh 20 thousand uh, manholes and about 2000 kilometers of sewer line. So all that network is now documented with all its details and levels. Next one. So then we also moved on to population forecasting. But before that, I will try another go at sharing my slide and sharing my screen and show you some of the maps that are there and what kind of information is available. Just give me a second. Okay, uh, let me share the Sakarai screen. Yeah, can you see this map now? Google screen? Yes, it's visible. Yes, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, so let me just zoom in. So this is the uh, city of Pune uh, with the rivers flowing through. Next. Uh, so these are the villages, fringe villages, which were subsequently added to the city. Uh, this is the natural network. And of course, your sewer network generally tends to follow the topography. So all this drains uh, centrally uh, near the river. Uh, and all the different colored uh, areas that you see, these are the sewage districts that we found. So then you have the pumping stations, uh, which are along the, along the river and those uh, existing STPs. And thus, there is a big project which is uh, constructing new STP. So those also have been documented. Uh, and then we will move on to see the uh, sort of areas where uh, detailed mapping uh, we can show. So all this green is now the network, which is there. Uh, zoom. Yeah. So now you can see this the, this network with different uh, diameter color. You know different colors represent different diameters of the line. So entire city has the network which is there. 
we'll just look at the data which is now attached to this so maybe we'll zoom into uh but yeah okay and then yeah so the, now the dots you can see these are the manholes which are there uh in the in the city and if you click on each uh, any of these you get the details which gives the ground level which gives the invert level depth of the manhole uh it actually also gives the population yeah, you, you can see the population which is actually you know uh draining sewage up to that that manhole and beyond in in different years as we have projected so all that data is now available so basically we have used this and uh, the next one that we have projected now is a pipeline itself so the sewer line also start and end node uh what is the material what is the diameter what is the slope all that is uh available at the click of the button now this is all on the on, on the gis platform so now uh just one so i'll exit this uh and we let's try and get back to the presentation maybe you can can you see my uh, the presentation now we can see the map ajit you can still see the map only yeah okay you have to get out i think and then share uh, right okay. yeah we are seeing your screen yeah okay now yes we can see the ppt right great okay yeah so based on this uh, uh we we've done some forecasting so all that model is now ready with us uh, and we we did for forecasting for 2017 that's when the initial work was done 2027 2037 considering all type of different uh, uh population projections uh and there is also a metro uh, work that is going on where pune corporation has allowed a much higher fsi in the areas affecting the metro so that also has been uh has been uh model so you can see this is the metro network at 500 meters on both side of the metro network is the higher fsi which is uh, which is made available which means that there will be much higher population there which will have a load on the sewer network so all that has been now modeled and now you have the uh, uh, study of the network and, and how it will behave in the next next 40 years or so these are of course the uh, uh, various checks that we put based on the cpho uh, standards so uh, entire collection network and trunk sewers of 2000 odd kilometers has been done and these are different uh, networks i have just shown you uh, some of them so we will not spend a lot of time on this uh so carrying out the analysis now and uh, just sharing you an example of one particular line uh from the from the model you, you can see 2017 this uh this is the the green that you see is the ground level that the, the blue that you see is the uh is the pipeline you can see that the sewer is you know fl flowing well within this but if you project it for the next 2047 you can see that you know it's it's, it's not going to be adequate so the city has now a projected map or projected data of all the sewer network that it needs to augment uh, throughout the city considering normal growth considering metro link growth so about six scenarios have been evaluated so based on that now they have a entire program of augmenting the the sewer line this is what we had found uh, after the initial study that uh, actually you need to actually change about 265 kilometers of the network Uh, for for it to be able to sustain the 2047 flows uh, based on that and based on yeah, you know the, all this micro data of you know how much uh, sewage uh, sewer line needs to be updated in each of the sewage districts uh, that is available so now the the municipal corporation is making uh, karna the the municipal corporation is now making uh, its uh, annual budget based on this uh, and every year lines are being sort of replaced uh so yeah that's uh, that's the data that i already showed you this is the different uh, diameters we also had to carry out some robotic survey for condition assessments uh which was was also carried out here are some pictures of slums and uh broken manholes as you can see uh, so all that data is now documented and then uh 
the PMC can take action on it. Uh, the other big advantage of this was looking at the uh, treatment capacities. So based on the population projections for the next 40 years and the existing network, now we have a phased manner, uh, you know, how much uh, sewage treatment is available, what's being carried out right now, what is under execution and what needs to be done in the uh, in the coming year. So based on that, sewage district wise, this uh, this data is available which the PMC is using extensively now. So, uh, yeah, there are some uh, common suggestions which we, have, which we have given to PMC, which is, you know, very practical ones related to how to keep the data and how, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, jamming of the manual covers, uh, what, what we should do. Regular ONM, uh, regular data maintenance, whatever new work that gets done, how to document that and put it back on the GIS uh, platform. So all that uh, is, is also formed a sort of basic work that uh, that, is done, that has been done under this study. So yeah, similar work, as I said, uh, for the uh, other uh, villages as well has been completed now and that documentation is also available with PMC. So that's it for now. Uh, uh, we also carried out actually later on at, for the for new villages, uh, extensive data on septic tanks and their uh, status. That's also been documented and based on that now PMC has planned about four or five fecal sludge treatment plants in the in the new uh, newly uh, included villages because the STPs are going to take a long time to build. So all that data is now available, as I said, and uh, yeah, it's, it's helping the PMC plan and implement its drainage project much more effectively. Thanks. And sorry about all the glitches around the presentation. I think we have not been able to figure out uh, how to show this way. Sorry I, about that. I, I always tell my colleagues that, you know, Maharashtra is the most professional uh, state as well as the presenters, both in the development sector and in all sectors. And all three presenters, actually three out of the five today are from Maharashtra, you, Pratima, and also Manas. So you stuck to the time. So thanks a lot for sharing. And it's a lot of information and a lot of detail which you have shared. And I'm sure we can, uh, we have to break for a Q&A at this stage now. So if yeah, we, yes. so we we had planned a Q and A at this stage so that you know we don't do it at the end. So I would uh, invite any participant to raise any questions by raising their hand, or we can also have Pratima and Ajit also respond to some of the Q and A which they think are important to respond. Not everyone, not all the points, but uh, any anybody in the audience who wants to. Raise a question, please raise your hand. Or Pratima, you can start by just responding to some of the main points or the questions which have been posed to you. And in the meantime, Ajit can also look in the chat box. And other panelists I are also most welcome to say anything. Yeah. Okay, I, I thought I had answered most of them, but I think one of the things that, uh, one of the questions that was asked to me was, how did you facilitate the actual toilet delivery on the ground, which I, which was completely uh, not touched upon? So if um, I, I'll just quickly say that it was a cost sharing model. The, uh, the gov government invested in laying the sewerage networks uh, we had a lot of CSR uh, funding support, which allowed us to, uh, you know, uh, do the data part, the actual uh, mobilization on the ground, the IEC part of it. And uh, also um, it funded the, the toilet materials that we uh, delivered at the doorstep of every beneficiary families who then constructed it at their own cost. So you'll find that if you visit our project, every toilet looks different. Uh, different finishes, uh, different positions. I mean, depending on how uh, the connection, connect, how the suitable was the connectivity. So there's a whole range of uh, uh, you know different kinds of uh, optimal optimal use of space that you can see within everybody's houses because they were all of different size, differing sizes. And one of the questions that came out is that isn't it very expensive to lay drainage networks? And how did you go about it? And um, I mean, why did you choose that kind of an option? I thought that was a good question because the data threw up that, like, for instance, Pimpri Chinswood Municipal Corporation, 
it has extensive sewerage networks across the city. It was only the slums which were on the edge of it. And instead of, uh, you know, then, uh, and all of us are aware that, you know, in larger cities, the densities in slums is pretty high. Then probably don't have the kind of uh, space where they can even put in a, a septic tank or sometimes there's no space for even common septic tank. So in such kind of situations, it made more sense to then just draw the networks in and make sure that within those tiny houses, people still have an option of taking taking a, a, a toilet. So which is why uh, the governments also thought it made a lot of sense looking at the, the kind of data that came up the spatial data and were willing to invest and they've really invested crores of rupees in uh, in laying sewerage networks across the seven cities that we worked in. Great, <laughs> great Pratima. Um, Ajit, there are some questions for you also in the chat box. Uh, can you see them? Access yeah, yeah. Just, just give me a second. Would you like to respond to any? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me go from the top. Uh... You are not all, and the rest you can answer directly. But whichever is the main one which you think can be, you know, benefited in your response, you please do that. Yeah, just a second. There are some. Um, what do you learn? Ajit, I thought there were some which were very technical and they were really aimed at you. Uh, I have <laughs> a... Mm, Q&A, yeah, hang on. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, all these, the open ones, uh, I think there were some which uh, have been classified as an equation to Ajit. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, somebody asking the question, is this data available in public domain? Yes, it is. Uh, I think it's on the Pune Corporation website. Uh, it took about a couple of years to complete this whole thing. Uh, and uh, it was actually, for, uh, so we were hired by Pune Municipal Corporation to carry this out. Uh, so we have done it. So external consultancy is us who have actually done it. Um, was it part of PMC's annual budget? Yes, uh, it was. Uh, it was uh, something that was initiated by them, and all the improvements, the small whatever uh, changing of pipes and all that, that's also being done by them year by year. Uh, uh, the, then there's a question about decentralized wastewater treatment systems. Yes, I'm a big fan of them. Pratima probably knows we're already working on quite a few of them, but this is uh, this work that I shared with you uh, was for the entire city of, of an existing network. And of course, a city of size of Pune with, you know, 40, 50 lakh people, uh, you can't always go with decentralized solutions. There are, I mean, the uh, the very scale of these, even decentralized solutions is fairly large at, at that scale. So uh, Pune has about, already has about 10 STPs and there are, 10 more being constructed. We have proposed another seven or eight. So all that will be about, I don't know, 25, 30 STPs uh, finally. So yeah, I mean, uh, uh, of course, there is a, there is a big thing about uh, having uh, decentralized wastewater treatment plants. And I do feel that if the cities were planned uh, in a more organized fashion and keeping the decentralized wastewater treatment systems in mind, then we would have more opportunities because right now in cities like Pune, it's all about space, where the space is available to carry out these treatments. So, yeah, certainly I think the decentralized waste but order treatment is... There is one is question, Ajit, from Dorai Narayana. He is saying yeah. Pune study were the underground sewer conditions and functionality assessed and through which um, was this okay. or you generally looked at yeah we did we didn't carry it out but uh yeah to be honest it wasn't that extensive it was more uh you know where we we found critical problems in terms of sewer network being there but you can't spot the flows or you know things like that or where uh the there were issues in actually documenting the the, the network that's where we used uh, uh robots and underground cameras but they, they were not in the, in the huge number mostly we did it 
uh, good old way by opening the manual chambers. You know, there are there are these technologies available, but I do still have a lot of reservations around them because its its use is fairly restricted. Like for example, if you want to do a uh, uh, video videography of an underground sewer, you actually have to uh, wait till the flow in the uh, sewer has uh, substant you know uh, substantially gone down because underwater these things can't go. And city like Pune or any any large city, the sewers are always flowing nearly full. So it's very difficult to actually uh, run these things. So, so whenever we had to uh, do these kind of surveys with robot cameras and all. We had to spend two days to do, say, 50 or 100 meters of network. And when you're talking about 2,000 kilometers, that doesn't add up anywhere. So, yeah, I mean, they, there are, uh, in for critical locations, I think it's a, it's a very interesting and useful technology, but not as a general uh, across, the, across the board kind of a solution. One more thing I wanted to ask, because there was this thing about whether data is available in the public domain. I would like to say that, um, on our website, we published all our data, spatial data for all the cities, and every city has also linked their website to our website. So, you know, bringing it to a much wider audience, which I think uh, if anybody is interested, please do see, uh, take a look at it. <clears throat> Thank you, yeah. Jeet and Pratima. I would like, uh, let's move on now. I would request uh, Rohit Ji to please come in. Rohit ji, aapke, do you have a slide? Uh, so you have raised your hand also, Rohit. Please, please come in. Yeah. Just want to ask Mr. Oak, uh, what is the percentage coverage of uh, you say population through sewers in Pune? Yeah, Pune uh, city, as I said earlier, the core city part, uh, which is about 250 square kilometers, that's, I can safely say it's more than 95, 96% covered with sewer network. But the fringe villages which have been added, which is almost the same area as the existing uh, area of Pune, uh, is not connected and that that's work under progress that's been happening now in the last six months or so. So in the overall, uh, whatever is the present jurisdiction, what is the percentage of population which will be covered? If I, if I leave the fringe areas, uh, the fringe area would be definitely less densely populated. Is that? Yeah, easily, easily more than 75-80% with the new area. Uh, the existing uh, the 250 square kilometers, I would say it's close to 100%. But uh, considering new areas, let's say, I, I'm just using a very sort of approximate number, but it would be easily 75% overall. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you can come in, please, with your presentation or overall. Or, uh, Put on your camera also, Rohit. Just a second. Can you see the presentation? Yes, it's visible. And uh, is it also moving? The next slide. <laughs> No, it's not moving. Uh, try moving it. Mm -hmm. No. No. Try using a scroller or uh, or a click button. Yeah, I was doing that only. <laughs> Anyway, I'll just try to, uh, you know, just move it one by one and let me get out of this. Now, can you see the second slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for excellent presentation and thank you CSC for inviting uh, uh, CPHO to give its views. And uh, we had uh, listened to uh, three or four very uh, wonderful presentations, we've seen them also, uh, which covered the larger cities. Currently, the focus of uh, the mission which I support, uh, which CPHO supports is the small cities in this country, which are in the process of coming up to uh, up to these uh, levels. And then, uh, you know, you would also note that there would be a, a difference in uh, when you plan for uh, what you call for planning versus retrofitting. 
So in many of our urban cities, which have grown up in uh, the past, uh, Pune being an example, when uh, you say the first batch of seawards had come up, first batch of seaward areas had come up in uh, British times, and then the population of Pune would have been in maybe a few, uh, you know, lakhs, two or three lakhs, and now it has gone up to 50 lakhs. So uh, cities have always been trying to catch up with the need of the uh, uh, this. Uh, um, you know how to manage their wastewater. So when we uh, in the current uh, Swachh Bharat mission phase, where use water management has also become a component, uh, so we are planning for this for the smaller cities because Swachh Bharat only deals with smaller cities which have got a population of less than one lakh. So there was always a uh, you could say a deliberation whether these small towns need to be provided with uh, you could say. Uh, public sanitation facilities or do we allow them for the time being to be left on their own and we also only manage the uh, operation and maintenance of the on-site disposal systems which these uh, households would be having basically the septic tank systems or something equivalent to that so that being the uh, being the you could say initial point of uh, our uh, uh, planning uh, then uh, we went for you know uh, multiple stakeholder uh, interactions and we also felt that there was a uh, kind of uh, reluctance among many of the city managers to take up this public uh, sanitation service and they were you could say uh, considerably more uh, happy allowing the public or the allowing the citizens to manage their own uh, wastewater while they uh, would uh, definitely like to uh, get involved with the management of the uh, the operation and maintenance of the septic tanks basically what we will what we'll be calling as the fecal septic management so this this was their concern so now uh, you know as this as this mission has gone up in uh, almost two years uh, what we are finding is that we are still stuck with the uh, in this, uh, uh, with this question, and while our, uh, you could say, technical inputs which we give to the cities, we are uh, quite uh, uh, concerned that CPHO points to the, you know, the growth which the developed nations have seen and how they have grown up, uh, or their smaller towns have grown up with a vis a vis their sanitation facility. However, considering the 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 limitations of our small cities. Uh, the it has to be a kind of a two pronged approach depending on the financial and the uh, other uh, uh, you could say uh, concerns of the uh, city in question because one size cannot fit all so we are also very uh, uh, much uh, you could say flexible to that point that uh, the cities will be having the last say on this but as far as the theoretical part of the planning is concerned for our small cities definitely uh, the next few slides uh, are, you know, everybody knows about it that we will be collecting primary and secondary data from various sources. And then we should definitely know before, uh, you know, we start our planning, what is the objective, what is the outcomes which we uh, need to come. So we all will agree that the objective of any municipal wastewater management would be to ensure that all pollutants which were otherwise get, getting into your immediate environment, they are neutralized. And all the uh, pathogens are killed. So, and the water could be, if possible, made available for reuse. So, these could be the kind of outcomes which a city needs to be planning. Because ultimately, the outcome or the objective is the health concern. So, with that, our basic design considerations would be covered under uh, five or six of such uh, headings. Uh, the main being the engineering considerations, because, uh, and then uh, you could always say that the environmental considerations, institutional considerations, uh, which I'll be covering in the next few slides. So all these uh, are the considerations, and then uh, you know financial aspect definitely is the has the overriding bearing. Community awareness also, community awareness as well as the community's intent, whether they are satisfied with their present lot or do they want to get into the next level of uh, sanitation. That too is a uh, uh, you could say point of consideration. So from the engineering perspective, I'll be just be covering a few uh, things because most of the uh, audience out here, I think is quite learned. So design period and population, definitely sanitation services in case we are to provide a, a 
utility even if i am to provide a utility for my own household at uh, you know at the moment when i invest i'll try to plan so that my you know for a certain years in future the the, the facility is sufficient for that so when we design for uh, wastewater uh, infrastructure we'll also have a design period in mind so in earlier times cpho manuals and such documents have stated that we need to design all our civil structures which can stand for a period of 30 years growth and your electromechanical infrastructure uh, components of the uh, of the plant they can be designed for 15 years because of machinery may require to be replaced and such things now with our new knowledge which is available to us and how this you know the science and technology is getting involved into wastewater management even period for a uh, infrastructure for 30 years a civil works uh, seems to be on the higher side case in point is uh, the navi mumbai Navi Mumbai, we understand, was a planned city which came up in the year around 1990s, early 1990s, and they had planned their wastewater infrastructure for 30 years hence. Today, with the population which has grown after that, you know, grown whatever uh, number of times from 1990s design population, still Navi Mumbai, I've been told, is not able to even utilize 50 percent of their wastewater uh, treatment facilities. so and and that was one part that facilities have been over and secondly that have still have the need of you know coming up with new uh, plants because the site the town has grown in a different direction so this we, when it was a planned city and just imagine the case when it's an unplanned growth you have just a you know small group of villages which has come together and then you just make it a urban uh, you know through a government order an urban uh, city or urban town has been created and then we do not even know whether the city is going to grow if it's a small city or the city is uh, you know just uh, just just one spurt of development and then there is a stagnation in hills we are finding already the people are moving to uh, you know different uh, larger cities for the sake of their uh, employments and other activities so various combinations can occur and at any given time if we start planning too much into future that's our current understanding that will be the wrong way of uh, you know investing so and also that has also given waste water treatment a bad name because you say the projects are exhaustive and pro projects are very big second point is about you know if we plan too short a future like in case of uh, uh, swachh bharat mission our advice had been that you only plan for 5 to 7 years and only try to cover the core areas 5 to 7 years in future and happen that once the next uh, uh, spot of your just imagine this is a small town we are just asking that you cover the core area which will be having a population of 50 to 60000 and then when the next spot of growth comes in your town in a different pocket there will have another decentralized facility and decentralized network so this way we can cover more and more area so that was our uh, you could say uh, you know uh, intent and uh, suggestion to the cities but then the engineers of the cities had this query about the if we design too small for our pipelines and other things the pipelines may uh, you know over a period of time they will start uh, becoming choked because of excessive flow and the overflow problems will be there so mr oak uh, he is uh, is designed for pune and other places and uh, our uh, also uh, you know assessment of cpho is that when in the initial plan for uh, pipelines was that small pipelines will only flow up to 50% full So uh, the pipes, which are uh, less than 600 mm di uh, diameter, they were supposed to flow only 50% full. And if the pipe was to be more than 600 mm diameter, they can be designed for 80% full at the design uh, population. So uh, with two parameters, one the one being that uh, you know our population is not going to grow in that arithmetic and geometric progression as was earlier. But on the other hand, there will be a movement from rural to urban areas and from small urban areas to larger urban areas so in the smaller urban areas what we have been suggesting under sbm2 that you need to design your pipes in such a way that at today's population they are only flowing 30% full and as soon as for the for the today's population that is the 2025 26 population if the pipe is to flow 30% full by that time it reaches around 50 to 70 to 80% the population would have stagnated or the city's growth pattern would have been Uh, identified second component uh, which we can uh, you know we uh, can discuss in any considerations are topography now topography is a very very major element in uh, any uh, uh, waste water management design because most of our flows are under gravity so uh, this definitely is a consideration and uh, because this topic today is about the data and the use of gis 
for such uh, you could say uh, development then definitely the topography is something which we can uh, you know be if if the if the existing uh, facilities or the existing you could say uh, aerial photography and others they can give us the three dimensional uh, grid to that uh, uh, specification that we can design a, a sewer network uh, so uh, so that is where it can be uh, helpful depth of groundwater table i like to cover this very uh, this is a very very important point point and uh, then few other areas like uh, uh, limits of the on site disposal because it's very easy to say we can have decentralized facilities and then we'll use the water on site itself so it is impossible to use the water on site just imagine the kind of water which is being discharged on a daily basis so you know if, if anybody wants to uh, like i'll cover it later on in case it comes as a question it is just impossible that we can utilize all our uh, used water all our waste water on site so it has to be taken a reasonable off site facility where for multiple usage and next best usage for an urban waste water this uh, treated waste water would be agriculture because most of our urban uh, you put the towns and cities especially the smaller urban centers they always have a agricultural belt around them and that agricultural belt can easily take the treated water so do not try to be for at least for smaller cities that too much of on site uh, or very close to the uh, decentralization those terms decentralization is fine but decentralization has to be based on the topography and such other uh, uh, such uh, factors right so uh, reuse options and potential that uh, this is also covered in that same because we uh, are you muted uh, rohit we can't hear you and if my 2.5% is just treated we can if we can just move it slightly outside uh, to the uh, outside of the town it will be very uh, the um, easily be usable by the agricultural areas rather than trying to find an uh, space for it to be used uh, there's some min minor, minor potential in uh, you could say urban landscaping and in case of uh, the local usages like street cleaning and such other thing but this is very minor as compared to the quantum of water which is being released then uh, yeah, i'll just leave the institutional aspect okay environmental consideration once again the groundwater quality comes in as a very very important uh, factor because which i like to explain out here see if we have an on site disposal system which osds as it's called in the western countries and we call it as a septic tank the septic tank system requires a soak well to be made uh, available next to it and soak well is, has to be designed based on the soil percolation rate so based on our country's nature of soil most of the soil is loamy and clay loam loam the typical footprint for this soak well for one household of five people needs to be in the range of around 30 square meters because that is the kind of footprint in which this water will settle or it can be evapor transpirated so this is the design uh, you know soil percolation rate if you cal calculate through this uh, equation we'll be getting this kind of area for a household for a proper uh, disposal of their uh, waste water in, within your you know you could say premises and this data is this uh, the, the area which i'm trying to mention out here even in the american system where they don't have a soak well but they have something called drainage fields the same uh, you know uh, amount of area is required and uh, <clears throat> that is why uh, in USA, I think the norm is that they cannot be more than uh, two septic tanks for the on-site disposal system, uh, system OSDS-based households in more than one acre. So that means each household must have an area of 0.5 acre in an urban area to have an on-site disposal system. That, this is the reason because your wastewater has to be managed within, within your own uh, uh, you could say locality if it can be percolated into the ground it is very good because the ground at a, if you have a certain depth till the ground water it can take care of most of your pollutants but in our case this uh, uh, number one this area is generally not available and second is in case it grows into you know urban uh, general discharge we allow it to flow into our drains or into our marshes or your urban spaces and we allow it to be lost into our urban uh, uh, you know um, subsurface or gets into the um, surface waters then the problem is that we do not know how much pollution has been uh, you could say we have delivered on a daily basis i just try to make a small estimate that based on you know if i got a small town of population of just 100000 
and uh, it has got a 60% septic tank coverage, let us say, because most of my smaller towns have almost got 100% coverage. But even if it was to be 60%, then these 15,000 households at a rate of you know, urban uh, discharge of 500 liters per household in two years period will be discharging around 5.5 billion liters of water. Right. So this 5.5 billion liters of water, if we had collected and treated them, it could have been you know made available for reuse. But we are losing it to the uh, you know ground, and then we are pumping for our uh, drinking water needs from another source and bring it back to the city. So this can be really short circuited, and we can uh, you know, reuse it for at least for the agricultural purpose. So this is one concern. But secondly, is the concern of what is the potential of uh, removal of pollution. So a typical septic tank by itself would not remove more than 30 to 40 percent of just one indicator of pollution, which is the BOD. So in case uh, you know we say 40 percent BOD gets removed in septic tank, so over a three-year over a two-year period, most almost 985 tons of BOD have been lost into the environment because we do not know where it is uh, getting treated because the septic tank has done its bit, but rest of it is getting into the environment. So that means that if you take on a daily basis, that means in a population of one lakh, 45,000 people are still, you know, defecating in the open within the town environment. But uh, we uh, cannot see it because it is being lost into the surface water through our nalas and such other things, and or it is, you know, drained into the subsurface. So, so you know, there is a potential in rural areas and sparsely populated fringe areas that this kind of water can be absorbed by the environment and the environment also has the potential to uh, uh, revive. But if the density is too high, then this becomes a serious problem. So uh, we are running out of time. If you can. Yes, yes, I'll not cover anything. Finally, because of the smaller towns, I've got this financial aspects as their uh, you know, basic cost of concern. So many of the towns are coming back to us that they are still not in a position to take up any treatment uh, system except for the fecal septage uh, and such other things. So we are willing to, you know, for a very small town, we are still willing to understand that, you know, because the density of population is too less, the cost of laying sewers per capita will be too high. But at a certain threshold point, we need to really, uh, uh, you know, t put our, uh, you could say, uh, you know, for the best interest of the population at present and for the future. This was a very nice slide, but I don't know whether this, because this has got a lot of animation. Can you uh, see the slide moving? Or is it not moving? No, it's not moving. Okay. Uh, the animation will only show in slideshow view. Uh, because this was something I was trying to show all the planning uh, required to be done for a smaller town. And, you know, at a certain point in time, you have to take a call on whether you will allow the entire town to get into an on-site business or you will start to invest money into the uh, into the uh, collection of this uh, wastewater because this wastewater is not going to stop. The wastewater will keep coming into your town on a daily basis. And as the population grows, more and more wastewater is going to come. There is never going to be a respite. And like the calculation which I have tried to do, if the wastewater is not taken to a treated uh, treatment uh, point, then definitely it is going to get into the environment. So uh, this uh, could have been a good uh, you know, slide, but definitely uh, some other time maybe. And uh, last point which I like to note, bring to for notice is for planning versus retrofitting. Out here, what I'm trying to say is that if you just take a small pocket of land in your town and as the town is growing these blue uh, you could say the blue uh, uh, areas are developed and they have their own, own on-site uh, systems and the yellow areas are to be developed later so if i lay my network now it will be possible that i do not the yellow households or the yellow areas do not have to invest into the on-site sanitation system so this is a two-way thing whether you want to ignore you ignore or at your own peril because finally the environment is getting polluted in your town. So you have to take a call at the right moment of uh, time and make sure that, you know, uh, to a certain threshold point, once the threshold is exceeded, before that threshold of density or of that population density is there, you need to have the alternate, uh, you know, system in your place. Second point, which was also out here was again, like the, in case of, uh, you know, you have single story buildings and you have created this uh, on-site system, uh, disposal system. So a single story building with one house, the septic tank and the soap well can take care of the, uh, you know, discharge. But once you have multi-story building and all, many of our smaller towns are now within that same, that the core area of the town where the main markets are there, you have this huge multi-story things coming up. We are on the same footprint more than, 
you know, where which was designed for one household, you have a very high uh, density of population, uh, many more house uh, people are staying. Then again, is it possible for the same OSDS for the same septic tank to take care of uh, the discharge, which is which will not be there, right? Last slide is where can GIS or AI and uh, such other uh, AI definitely not, but GIS and uh, uh, such uh, you know existing systems definitely are a big uh, help in case we they can help us to plan uh, you know that when to strike what is the point at which the city needs to strike and what kind of arrangement that city needs to make because gs can also help us in planning to an un un understanding that this city is not going to grow and the city may uh, you know stagnate at a certain population or is going to grow in a different direction uh, one portion of the city will grow and the other will not grow so those kind of uh, you know inputs with the GIS can provide us with intelligent uh, to intelligent applications. Definitely, they'll be uh, very helpful. And uh, uh, it is very important, like you just said, that we must fully understand that whatever our underlying assumptions. Because if we do not understand that, what is the need, what is the objective, and what are the <clears throat> what are the assumptions based on which our planning has been done or on which this GIS and other software is working, then we'll get very wrong. Uh, outputs. So this is one. And uh, right, okay, then I'll stop for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit Ji. Thank you very much. That was a very nice engineering explanation. And that is what we wanted from you. And uh, I could not show my main slide, which was bad. <laughs> Any some other time. Yeah, so I'm sure. And uh, now I would request uh, Professor Mona here to share the urban planning aspect of this whole issue of uh, improved database planning. So how does the formal urban planning, in, you know, integrate or merge with this? Mona, your presentation, please. Thank you, Dipenderji. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for setting up this series of informal discussions and uh, for the invitation. And uh, thanks to all my uh, predecessors in this session who have set such a nice tone, starting from the CSE presentation and then presentation by Pratima Ji, Ajit Ji, and Rohit sir. Uh, it, re it really lays a very good background for me to take on from here. And there are some key points from urban planning perspective that I plan to uh, discuss today. Uh, I'll just share my screen in a moment. Yes, it is visible now. It is in the presentation mode also? Yes. Great. Yes. So uh, as Dependerji said, I'll talk about the urban planning perspective for today's topic, which is improved sanitation outcomes through better data and planning. Uh, how do urban planning practice and pedagogy respond to the sanitation outcomes? What are the opportunities, challenges, and the changing paradigms we have witnessed as urban planning professionals or teachers in urban planning? Typically, when we talk about urban planning, all of us visualize planners to be planning cities, the physical layout of the streets, the way cities will grow, locating the green spaces, public services, etc. This is the conventional understanding of planning which itself has gone a lot of change in last one and a half decade. From a mere allocation of land uses, be it a market or a school, police station, hospital, green spaces, parks, gardens, which we typically and traditionally understand urban planning to be doing, which is the popular understanding. Uh, the discourse has shifted in last two decades to be closer one and a half decade. Planning has gone also sectoral along with being spatial. And sectorally, when we talk about urban planning, we talk about urban infrastructure and basic services, which today's context specifically blue green infrastructure, water sanitation, hygiene. Uh, planning sectorally also talks about urban transport, transit systems, improved mobility. It talks about urban housing, housing for the poor, implementation of various housing programs. And also off late since last decade or maybe half a decade, urban design taking a center stage when it comes to designing larger public 
places or planning larger public places and integrating them with the city fabric so that's the that's the setting in which i i mean to say urban planning but today i focus my discussion around the sectoral domain of urban planning which is urban infrastructure where sanitation is given more uh, sort of attention as a pedagogy and also as a practice so if we uh, sorry i think it uh, to yes so uh, i'm going to follow the uh, the uh, the logic with which these informal or the intent with which these informal discussions have been designed uh, essentially what we know about this what more we need to know what works and what does not work and what we must do to apply our learning in policy and practice considerations when it comes to sanitation outcomes and with urban planning in this. So if we uh, look at what we know, and by what we know, I mean typically what we understand, what is our common understanding as community of planners about, or community of urban development professionals about urban development and planning, and what is our common understanding about sanitation or environmental sanitation as Borda puts it up. So if we talk about urban development and urban planning, we essentially all these six components, land use management, as I said, was the premise with which planning started uh, or continued in our country. Uh, poverty reduction, environmental protection, natural resource management, livelihood creation, creation of workspaces, markets, and public health. These are various aspects which urban development uh, and urban planning respond to. And if we talk about uh, the sanitation aspects, uh, these are the four elements which one can't ignore, and they work in a very integrated fashion. Uh, sanitation, excreta and wastewater management, which could be gray water management, black water management, fecal sludge management, solid waste management and its interaction with all the natural drains and clogging of natural drains by solid waste management, or clogging of sewer lines with solid waste and therefore that sector comes into 4a when a planner looks at or a sectoral planner looks at uh, sanitation stormwater drainage and discharge of treated water again a lot of wastewater after treatment gets discharged into the natural drains often a lot of untreated wastewater gets discharged into the natural drains and often these natural drains when they are not mapped they are also lost. They are also sometimes encroached upon. And therefore, a good understanding of stormwater drainage is important for a planner to address uh, urban sanitation solutions. And water supply, of course, because water supply and the quantum of water supply should be the key parameter considered by applying or using a particular way of sanitation, be it a toilet or a medium of transporting the uh, fecal sludge or sewage. So these are this is the premise, and this is something we know as urban professionals or urban planning professionals. I'm just putting it as a context to our conversation, and this is where we have so far arrived as community of practitioners, community of academics, and try to capture all of this in larger or smaller extent in our academic discourses and in our practice when we go out. But then, and let's look at very quickly about the urban sanitation journey that we have gone through as a country. And I'm not uh, spotting each and every program, policy, et cetera, that came in. But I've taken the larger points, which we see again over last two decades in our sanitation journey, urban sanitation journey. Uh, water supply and sanitation programs and projects is where we started as a nation. And this would be essentially piped networks and funding available for those piped networks. Uh, we moved on to city development plans, which were strategic plans and which included sections on water sanitation and how it should be strategically, uh, what kind of investment should be made and how the coverage in a city could be expanded. Uh, we also had a season of city sanitation plans, and I call it a season because it didn't last very long. But that was the time, at least as a document or as an approach, we looked at sanitation in a comprehensive way. Sanitation plans were prepared, uh, often not supported with exclusive funding for city sanitation plans. 
Thereafter, we are now at a juncture where we have several national missions and programs, Amrut, Swachh Bharat Mission, Smart Cities Mission, and many of them uh, intervene in the sanitation space and contribute to investments in the sanitation space. The discourses have also changed over a period of time, but the latest or the ones which are discussed more often these days are IUWM and CWIS, Citywide Inclusive Sanitation and Integrated Urban Water Management, besides many other approaches which uh, fit into these larger concepts. So that's the journey we have taken as, uh, as approaches to planning for sanitation in the cities. And uh, on the other hand, if I see, if I look at the uh, items I've listed here, it moved from sewage networks and treatment plants to discourses around centralized and decentralized approaches. How much to decentralize, how much to centralize, as uh, uh, Rohit very clearly pointed out that it's, it's, it's a challenge to decide how much we want to decentralize, whether they are operationally efficient, whether there is land available for those. But there was a thinking on decentralized, centralized, introduced at a particular point, not carried forward in all cities and the plans, but it does still remain a point of discussion in the urban planning and urban sanitation professional domains. Uh, moved the discourses, paid a lot of attention on toilets, fecal sweat septage management, fecal sweat treatment plants, manual scavenging, behavior change, and alternative fund, funding mechanisms of funding each and every aspect of the value chain. So this has been largely the urban sanitation journey and therefore the journey of urban planning professional and urban planning academics in this whole uh, sector. With this, I think, uh, and we can pick on particular examples or discuss them during the discussion, I've not brought in here those typical examples which would reinforce some of the points that I'm making. Uh, if we talk about what more we need to know, what works and what does not work from an urban planning perspective, this is based on the work that we have done in the sanitation sector as professionals, in advisory capacity as academics, interaction with the professionals in various forums, uh, many of whom are present here today, either attending or part of the panel. So this is based on the larger experiential knowledge that exists today and that we have access to or we have experienced. So uh, urban sanitation, uh, from a planning perspective, it's extremely important that we look at it as an interconnected web. And it's not sanitation as a standalone thing. It has very strong correlation with how the city water supply systems work, how the wastewater systems are laid, how the storm water, both natural and man-made works, and how the solid waste is managed in the city. Until and unless we look at all these four sectors in an integrated way and the data related to each of this sector, uh, it will be difficult to plan a system which will be sustainable in the long run. Uh, uh, and this would call for data about water supply networks. Uh, we saw a wonderful presentation of Pune and its commendable work that Pune has done. But I'm talking about the second tier cities or smaller cities who do not have such sophisticated databases. And often when planners work with these cities, we struggle uh, to get lay hands on water supply networks. Bore wells, if they are run by the ULBs, information is available. But for private bore wells, it's a known fact that there is no database which gives us access to the private bore wells. It's important to know this because if there is on-site sanitation system and the possibility of contamination of groundwater, the knowledge about the location and the depth of groundwater is extremely important. So the data about bore wells, uh, there are initiatives and programs which are now talking about aquifer mapping through private and public bore wells. And I think if we proceed in that direction, probably we would have made a good movement. Uh, data about sewage networks, septic tanks, uh, natural drains, natural water bodies, solid waste nuisance points. Uh, these are some of the spatial databases. If we talk about uh, revenue records, and therefore the title or the tenure of the land 
uh, the lands on which slums are located, the lands on which water bodies are located, because often when they are not identified, not notified, water bodies get encroached upon by not just informal, even by formal development. And for slums often, I'm sure uh, uh, my colleagues here would agree, uh, land tenure is extremely important when service provisioning is to be uh, provided to these. So land records, revenue records are an important database, not that easily accessible. Available budgets for capital may still be available, but operation and maintenance and cost recovery of these systems that we put in place, because the sectoral planning domain also looks into not just provisioning of these services, but also operations and maintenance and operational sustainability. Departmental roles and responsibilities, types of contracts, availability of staff. This is all that we need to know, and we need to know what works and what does not work from these perspectives. Uh, the areas which often get ignored or are paid less attention to in city level plans and hence the data capture are the vulnerable groups, be it slums, low lying areas, which may not be necessarily slums, but could be low income uh, uh, groups, schools and access to sanitation in these schools, particularly public schools and public places and access to sanitation in these public places. These are generally uh, uh, appendage to the larger city level planning exercises or larger level city sanitation exercises. So this is what uh, 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 what works, what doesn't work, or what, where we need to pay attention to when it comes to data, which will help us improve the sanitation outcomes. If we talk about what we must do to apply our learning and policy and practice, there are lots of points, but I've tried to keep five uh, key uh, areas which we need to work towards. Uh, one is how the data, which is right now available as pilots, and when I say pilots, it could be a couple of cities, a few areas within the cities. How do we use this kind of data or methods in which this data was captured? How do we, um, uh, how do we use it for getting a citywide understanding or citywide data? How do we, uh, off late, urban India has seen a lot of data reporting systems often linked to ranking, rating, and how do we use these data, how do we make these data systems easy to use for the ULBs and do not become merely the reporting mechanism for ranking, but are also used for their service improvements. That's one area which must be paid attention to while we while we are in the quest of generating more and more data, how do we make it usable for the urban local bodies, especially the second and third tier urban local bodies, which have very limited human resource abilities as well. Uh, third is interdepartmental use of data to address cross-cutting issues. It's a larger urban governance challenge. Uh, fourth, integrated programs with funding support. Uh, we have programs which are looking at sectors in isolation, but can there be a program which looks at an integrated approach to sanitation and there is a funding support available to that? How can work done by various professionals in the sanitation sector inform policy and program making in that direction? Uh, the last point from a planner's perspective, how do we make flexible land use for decentralized options? As my previous presenters very rightly pointed out, we do not often know in which direction city will grow. Sometimes the projections may work, sometimes they may not work. How do we make the land use flexible so that we find land and space to put up these decentralized sanitation options? So these are some of the, uh, the points that I wanted to reflect on today from urban planning perspective. And that's it from my side, more during the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mona. Thank you so much. And your last slide is about set. So thank you for presenting. And uh, I request uh, Manus and Jagan to please come in now with your we don't want need to do summing up of good presentations. I realize that, but you can please share your comments or you know points. So, so Mark, uh, Ajit, Ajit has his hand up. Okay, Ajit. Yeah, are we allowed to ask questions now? 
two quick questions <laughs> you can of course sajid yeah so uh, one the first one for rohit ji uh, uh, you did mention the fact that you know this uh, covering these uh, the urban areas most of the urban areas with the entire sewer network uh, is a big task and basically will consume a lot of time etc so in the field the message that we get is the is that uh, cpho is not encouraging having fecal sludge treatment plants under swachh bharat in urban areas however i do believe that at least for tier 2 tier 3 cities i think that's a very ideal solution if you can have a good desludging facility and fstp is to go with them i think that will answer a lot of the questions so why not go with that under the swachh bharat mission in uh, for the smaller towns at least so and uh, we are saying that we can have a co processing in the medium towns if you say small see a 1 lakh population or 50000 population town is no, no longer a small town in any international uh, you could say um, uh, reckoning you will find that these are uh, very uh, very important towns davos for example is just got a population of 50 to 20000 but it's a you know one of the uh, renowned towns and 50 to 1 lakh are those towns which are generally about to stabilize and they if we do not strike now if we do not have the systems now then the population density and such other things will start getting too big so what we are suggesting is that the core area you can have network which will be just around 30% for, you know area of the town and where maximum population resides that's the old town area because if you do not do it now in next 5 years 7 years it will still become denser more people you know coming up and then it will become even more uh, difficult and the fringe area which is generally 60 to 70% of your town uh, which uh, has got a low population density you can do your on site system the same fsm you can practice but it, since you have a stp in the town the stp can easily take the load of this fsm for a small towns less than 20000 population totally with you we need not do anything we should and these are almost 2000 of our out of our 4800 towns have got a population less than 20000 so these 20000 will say each other town we are totally with you we need not uh, try any anything at this moment because we do not know whether this town is actually exactly uh, you know going to grow as per our projections wahan par you can have fsm kind of a system and between 20 to 50000 that is the point uh, that's the area where gpho was suggesting that the local administration can take a call whether you want to delay it for the time being you want to go on for on site as an interim measure but also are thinking of uh, you know making up some coverage um, at least uh, for the beginning or uh, you can have a smaller stp which is only say around 50% of your present population and for that the stp can take in most of your septage load plus also some uh, networking of immediate surrounding area uh, can be done up one very critical parameter which i always uh, mention and that's why i wrote my question was to you also that you say 50 lakh population 20000 km so always in a bigger town uh, we are finding that the average per capita length of sewer is 0. Point some meter like in case of pune it is 0.4 meter in case of delhi it's 0.58 in case of bombay it is 0.1 something so that is our uh, you know that, that was cpho's initial thing that wherever you can lay a sewer at a length of less than 1 meter per capita you will be finding economy in putting other than getting the people who will be coming up in future and they are making their own septic tank arrangement because that too is an investment of the public and that too is called going to cost 40 50000 rupees whatever so this this was our concern thank you okay great thank you very much yeah one quick question to i mean a comment to uh, mona ji's presentation also uh, you did mention that uh, you know uh, the fact that this data is available because pune is a big city just to remind that it, they didn't have the data it was created so basically i think that's the need of the hour that you know small towns big towns everybody there needs to be some investment to create that data i just wanted to make that comment thanks absolutely absolutely it's just about the capacities the smaller ulbs would have but the work done by pune is commendable and pune has always been a, a forerunner when it comes to any such concept i remember the environmental status reports were also something which was first produced by pune and all new thinking so thank you thank you for sharing your work uh, manas over to you okay thank you dipinder uh, so just wanted to summarize with a few points and maybe also raise questions for further discussion uh, i think what you have seen is that data and gis maps are a great platform and a common language 
to create more effective collaboration and coordination between government, businesses, NGOs, entrepreneurs, as well as community-based organizations. Today, everyone is working on either very high-level government data, like census and national family uh, health survey, or they create their own data, which is expensive and unreliable and makes it difficult to coordinate across multiple players. The lack of complete and updated data leads to poor planning and errors in implementation, and therefore failure of sanitation projects. Uh, I think one question is, who is the data for? Uh, as Ajit and Pratima both have shown that the data is open source, available to municipalities and other NGOs. But how can local governments in particular uh, use this data and maps effectively, the same question that Mona asked, uh, to plan infrastructure and services? Do their staff need to be trained? Do they need to recruit experts? Uh, do they have the budgets for that? Or do they need outsourced service providers who can help them to use the data more effectively? Uh, especially in, in the case of smaller uh, ULBs. And then what happens if such data is available but still not effectively used, which you also see a lot of, right? Uh, what is the attitude change, the institutional processes that need to change to ensure that data is used? And what are the consequences if they're still not used? The second question that comes up is who should create this data and maps? Now we have seen, uh, you know, businesses and NGOs creating it. So clearly, I think, you know, the question is, do we need dedicated organizations who prepare this data and maps, quality check them, and then maintain and update them uh, regularly, whether it's annual, every two years, every three years? Uh, now, these could be government agencies, they could be NGOs or private companies, but this needs to be done in a systematic manner because otherwise, again, multiple players will create multiple sets of data which do not talk to each other, right? Uh, so we need institutional structures and, and you know, maybe some even some policy level interventions to decide uh, you know, how this is done. And then how is this funded? Who gets control? Who gets to use it? Is there a financial model where this data is sold? Or is it uh, sort of a grant funded model where it is open to all? And what are the implications of the financing on things like the quality and the extensiveness so that you'll have the high use places will have good quality data. And again, where data is you know, uh, rural areas or smaller towns where there isn't as much of a financial model for the data uh, will again get uh, kind of ignored, right? Uh, so this is another set of questions that that come up. Uh, third, the big one really is what data to collect. So as Mona said, uh, you need comprehensive and holistic urban planning processes, which are necessary to make our cities livable and sustainable uh, because all the different sectors talk to each other. So you've got toilets, sewerage, water, health, waste, housing. Um, you know, So who collects this data? What's the resolution? Uh, do we need household level, community level, or city level data and maps? Uh, and then what kind of staffing and technology and money does all this require? So we need some mechanism for consultation processes to design the data architecture uh, so that whoever needs to use this data will then find the data that they need, uh, but also without making it so complicated that it will be error prone and impossible uh, to keep it up to date and accurate. Uh, we can also see how wash data uh, is useful for other environmental and social issues, including urban heat island effects, air pollution, flood warning systems, groundwater levels, uh, water bodies, and so the size and quality. Um, so, so all this needs sort of some understanding of you know where do we draw the boundaries uh, of data management. Uh, use of technology then comes in as the last point uh, that I have. Uh, you know, you've got today lot of technologies that are much more affordable than they were even a few years ago. So from satellite data to sensors that can be deployed on the ground, IoT systems for real-time data collection. Again, we shouldn't go crazy with technology just because it's available. Uh, it should make a good use case, should be useful. Uh, so how do we get this micro and macro data? And then how do we also analyze this data again without going with the hype of, you know, that machine learning and artificial intelligence will solve everything. But you know, it is true that you know, how do we bring in these new technologies uh, to make sense of this data and to use it for things like predictions or planning or you know, monitoring and seeing where there are problems uh, happening, right? Uh, I think GIS maps is getting a lot of push in the last two, three years, especially things that I, I just seem to notice that GIS is popping up in many more places. Uh, but I think you know, GIS mapping really is absolutely critical, especially in uh, space-constrained environments like most of our cities. Uh, maps can also help us to make uh, decisions more effectively around uh, you know, centralized versus decentralized. Uh, you know, we talked about things like shallow sewers, solitary sewers that we talked about in the last session. 
So how do we make these decisions in the absence of data and maps is, is sort of hard to figure out. So I hope this uh, summarizes some of the key points. Um, and uh, I think the last point is people will always say, what about the cost? I mean, the point is you're spending a lot of money building a lot of infrastructure. And at the same time, you're making a lot of mistakes. So if we invest in the data, that 1%, half percent, two percent invested in data, invested in processes will save us the 30, 50 you know, percent that we are spending on infrastructure, which is, let's say, suboptimally spent. Okay, it may not be a complete waste, but we're getting a lot of suboptimal outcomes. And I think a little bit of planning and a little bit of data can help us to save a lot more money. So we should not be penny wise and pound foolish when it comes to this sort of stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Manas. That's a good collection of uh, points you covered on data and who will collect for what and how and when and which mechanism and which end use. So thanks for raising that. Jagan, can you please come in now? Sure, Did sure. You... Um, <clears throat> thanks, uh, thanks, Dipinder, for including me. You continue thanks to help me. Thanks for waiting for so long till the end. Thanks for... No, I enjoy this. Actually, you've been helping me learn. So uh, sure. you know, I learned from each of these sessions. As, as you know, I work on urban policy mostly. So um, each of these sessions is, is extremely educative. Uh, and thanks, Manas, for ending uh, on a savings note. Uh, I think we tend to forget that uh, India is still a country that needs to save its money and use it use it well. So uh, even the Ministry of Finance talks about value for money as being a key priority. So let's always keep that in mind. Um, Dipinder, if you allow me, what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to share a, uh, a number of provocations which I heard from each of the presentations and then just share some, some overall points which I also have jotted down. And I think this has been an extremely rich uh, set of conversations which um, we should all reflect upon. And I, maybe I can help sort of pull out some of the key issues that I found. Uh, I think Umrah set us off in a, in a good way by just telling us about Sangam Vihar. And as you know, you know, at NIUA, we used to struggle with Sangam Vihar in so many different ways. Um, and the, the formal and informal dichotomy uh, is something that really gets highlighted in an example like that. Um, and it kind of connects with one of my key points, which is that when we talk about water and sanitation, we're talking about public goods. And what has happened in our cities is that water, sanitation, uh, even the kinds of you know, sanitation districts that Ajit talked about, we've, we are creating a sort of a balkanization of the public good itself, right? So uh, why is Sangam Vihar not uh, you know, data rich when possibly the next colony next door might be full of lots of data points? It's simply because it's, it's an unauthorized, so-called unauthorized society, uh, colony. And this dichotomy is becoming a big problem in cities, whereas actually you're talking about public goods uh, being distributed evenly across the population. So the jurisdictional boundaries, the boundaries between departments, all of these are creating a balkanization of what is basically uh, the creation of public goods. So I, you know, that was a good reminder right in the beginning. Um, and I think this jurisdiction issue Pratima also you know, brought up uh, in the map that in Navi Mumbai shows, you know, what are the jurisdictions of different owners of land, as Pratima put it, which is which is interesting because land is also a public good. You know, it's a, uh, you know, it doesn't. These agencies don't own the land; it, it actually belongs to the public. They are custodians of the land, and the way in which this balkanization has happened, even across departments, to me that that really jumped out from that presentation. But to me, the best uh, interesting example was that grading issue that Pratima talked about in Chinchpada in Airoli. Uh, where they had to install a pump to get the, you know, the the water into the biogas plant because they probably, if I understood correctly, Pratima, they didn't get the terrain uh, correct uh, in some sense. So, so it was just flowing in the wrong direction. And this is a bane of our, all our cities: uh, sewage flowing in the wrong direction, uh, rainwater flowing in the wrong direction. You know, it's just just getting terrain data as the base of our decision making seems to be a fundamental issue for our cities uh, because cities are spatial and they're also physical entities and they have topography. And we, we tend to forget that. And unfortunately, a lot of our planning has happened on a flat uh, map, right? So there is an assumption of flatness when we plan our cities, which when you come to water and sanitation because it's meant to flow, um, does not help at all, 
right? So, so just uh, just that was important, I think. But also uh, something Pratima said about you know the fact that they found these old networks that people hadn't been connected to, right? There were multiple networks existing and they hadn't been connected. And this kind of raises also the point about legacy data. Where did that data go? Those networks were installed. Uh, somebody mapped out that network. And yet we don't know. We don't know why people weren't even connected to those networks. Did the, did the households know that those networks existed? You know, so, so there is a kind of a sanitation history and a water supply history of our cities that also is really important to begin to pick up. And that's also kind of data that we must understand. Um, I think Ajit's, uh, to me, the, the uh, big question in my mind was, Ajit, and uh, maybe we can discuss this offline, but you know, how did you demarcate the sewage district? Because what, what it reminded me of is some work done by Anant Maringanti in, in Hyderabad. Uh, Anant had uh, really dug into the way in which different uh, engineering wards were different from municipal wards, were different from other kinds of you know, subdivisions. And uh, what you said about sewage districts was really interesting to me because does the sewage district actually, uh, you know, is it delineated as per existing delineations of some sort? Does it uh, aggregate uh, existing areas or are they completely new zones? And in that case, how do they fit with revenue collection? How do they fit with others? So it was an interesting question that was raised by that, by that point. Um, but uh, uh, a good thing that PMC will be the custodian of this master plan that you created, which is, which is really important. And I think what Manas said about, you know, how is this data going to be accessible uh, will become important. And I think the smart city mission is also, and especially the mission director has been very alive to this fact of data being available for decision-making. I hope that we will, we will move the needle on that. Um, Another in interesting point, Ajit, from your presentation was this forecasting, right? So it's interesting that you talked about forecasting and, uh, and Rohit also talked about forecasting. He said, don't, don't plan too far away. You said 2047 was the forecasting, right? Uh, and uh, CPHEO is saying, actually, maybe that's too long as a horizon. And people like me who work on sustainability say, hey, actually, it should be 100 years. You know, so so this is an interesting uh, sort of uh, you know thing related to forecasting and data management, which is uh, like Rohit put it. At which point should you take that call, whether you want to go in for a decentralized system or a centralized system, and obviously we will fall somewhere in between. And I thought that was that was an interesting sort of dynamic, um, and and I think it also raised another point, uh, which which was about. Uh, you know, how many different upgradation contracts are going to be issued over the next few decades if, if we are actually anticipating that we are going to be constantly upgrading? You know, why are we not upgrading at one go? After forecasting, what is the density increase as well as the spatial expansion that will happen in our cities? An interesting point about forecasting also uh, is that uh, as per calculations, the Indian population is going to stabilize by somewhere around, I think, uh, 2049, 48, 49, um, which means that now we should actually be talking about a stabilized population, right? And we also know which cities are attracting migrants and which are the cities that are not growing. So, you know, maybe there'll be some growth and, and we might actually only need to accommodate a little bit of growth, right? In most of those 2,000 cities that Rohit mentioned, uh, you know, are, are 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 the major bulk of our cities. Um, maybe we are actually only going to see very marginal growth because basically there are about six or seven metropolitan areas in this country uh, that are attracting all the migration. That that's the that's the overall migration flow in the country, net net. So uh, people people stay very uh, short durations in intermediate cities on their way to the metropolitan regions. So uh, when we know these patterns, I think the water and sanitation thinking should begin to respond, respond to that. Uh, Dipinder, I'll just take uh, four or five minutes uh, yeah. after this. Um, I think, uh, I, you know, I think Rohit uh, underlined the most important, for me, the most important thing, which is that we are all talking about public health, right? This is public health engineering. And, um, 
the data, uh, I think Mona also pointed out that the data needs to start getting correlated across different sectors and you know, not get siloed, that we only talk about data in the sense of water and sanitation departments and so on, but begin to correlate that with epidemiology, look at the outcomes, are people actually, uh, you know, we, we are saying we're supplying a certain amount of water, is that making people sick? Not because we are supplying the water, but because the water is not uh, handled hygienically. It's stored in very, very poor quality tanks and so on. So, you know, I think I think the health issue is ultimately the outcome that we need to achieve because that affects our economic goals. Uh, poor health and productivity losses are today a big burden on our economy. And we need to address that. And water and sanitation is actually at the heart of uh, uh, productivity in India. Um, I think uh, I think in terms of uh, you know again Rohit pointed out that you know this multi-storied uh, construction that's taking place on sites which were assumed to be single-storied uh, plotted housing. Um, I don't know how we can account for this because that throws all of our data planning out of gear. Uh, but uh, quite a provocative question. So just to sum up, uh, you know, overall, just some thoughts on this and. You know, this is a subject of great interest to me. Uh, we were involved uh, in helping the ministry set up a, a urban data observatory, which still has not fully met its potential. The creation of the ICCCs in 100 smart cities has still not been fully tapped, but at least some start was made in beginning to build data uh, repositories for cities. And today I'm involved in community data observatories as being the front line, because I think I think the ultimately the custodians of data need to become the co communities that are most affected by data. And in that sense, some of the work that Pratima has been doing is a good pointer to that. You know, the way that data is a public good, it needs to be available to everybody. Um, and communities need to work with their own data. It's not rocket science, communities can understand it. Uh, uh, Mahila Housing Trust is one NGO, uh, uh, Shelter Associates is another, which. People, people with not much education understand how data is uh, used. Uh, so it's, it's not rocket science. And very importantly today, the for horizon that's coming up uh, is that, uh, you know, there is a national platform called the Gati Shakti platform, which few people have taken cognizance of, but uh, now that platform, which has at least got 300 plus layers of data is now going to be slowly made available for local area planning. So we are going to have a kind of a rich data set and layers and layers of GIS information of the kind that Ajit showed us um, available uh, for administrators to access and for urban, uh, you know, local area plans. Currently, the platform is being used only for large trunk infrastructure projects. So we should keep this horizon in mind that we're suddenly going to be thrown into a very data rich environment. What will we do with that? Um, so on the whole, we realize that there's data for action, uh, which is about, for instance, implementation of solutions. It helps you to locate toilets. It helps you to locate sewage treatment plants and so on. There's data for diagnostics, right? So we need to understand, uh, is the water at the end of the pipe actually flowing? Uh, is it clean, right? So we've kind of lost touch with some of those uh, service level benchmarks and level of service issues that we talked about 10 years ago. And I think we shouldn't forget those uh, at all, um, not to mention the kinds of issues that are thrown up by uh, data coming from SCADA. Um, I think there's data for evidence-based planning, which is really crucial. So that's another sort of category. And here, terrain data, the storage tanks, uh, the groundwater re recharge potentials, the level of pollutants in wastewater, these are all things we know very little about. And what it requires, and I think the Swachh Bharat Mission is already aware of this, and they're working on it. Uh, I, I know the uh, on the on the solid waste side they're working on it certainly. Is that we need a whole network of local laboratories which are in institutions which are locally available and are public institutions, colleges, universities. All cities that have colleges and universities must have laboratories where people are able to monitor the quality of their water and sanitation uh, systems. And I think that's that's a very important network that we need to build. Uh, the water energy nexus is something we should start talking about more and more because not only because of methane uh, in the wastewater, but also because of 
uh, the fact that we consume a lot of energy in our water and sanitation systems, whether it is for uh, pumping systems or it's for purification and so on. And the data on that is very sparse. Um, so energy use, because it incurs an expenditure for municipalities, is a very important aspect that we must uh, must get more data on. Um, and my last sort of point is, and I think this is this is something that also I'm currently working on because I'm looking at green greening of procurement systems. Is the data for procurement is somewhat different from the data that we use to study these systems. Uh, and I think Manas is very cognizant of this that you know the the ways in which tenders are designed for procuring water and sanitation systems is totally different from the way in which we we study these systems. Um, and ultimately, the procurement systems matter because they set into motion contracts and arrangements by which contractors come in and implement these projects. And we don't even know, for instance, uh, you know, which is topically relevant today, uh, there is supposedly an obligation for contractors to uh, give, hand over the data they actually collect from each of their contracts. Um, I don't believe that I have, I have found any city that is consistently creating a database from all the data that is collected by their contractors, okay? This, there's drone data being collected. There's the kind of data that Ajit is, has collected for the PMC. Therefore, it will be there in the PMC, but many other contracts, we just don't follow the even the contractual ob obligations of surrendering the data, getting it from, what happens is that the contractors sell that data to other contractors or use it themselves for the next tender, uh, and the department doesn't keep it. So it's a it's a net loss to the public, right? Because that data doesn't get collected. So there's a lot here. Uh, you know, as I say, data is just numbers until it actually shows insights. And I think today's session has been just so incredibly insightful um, that um, there's there's tons to think about. And uh, I'll pause there. Thanks, Devinder. Thanks a lot, Zagan, for your uh, comments and, as usual, an analysis also of all that was discussed today. And from my side, I would just like to add one or two things, which are that there is also this issue of all of us are working on something, you know, Pune City, slums, or on, you know, CPHEO is working on manuals and records. But somewhere, you know, there is also this gap that uh, a unit of analysis, whether it's the country or the state or the city, that doesn't happen. So, and, you know, there's nobody to do that as well at the moment. And it's a sad reflection that we, we're talking about Pune's data as excellent, whereas it should have been there for most cities. And that doesn't exist. And, you know, we are still talking of one part of the city. In other cities, at least, we are still lost at that. And for Pune also, I think if you were to aggregate all the slums and the informal city, uh, informal settlements data, even that doesn't exist. So that is the kind of uh, state we are in. And we tend to get you know, lost in the, whatever we are doing, and which has a lot of meaning, whether it is Sangam Bihar or some other place. But this understanding of uh, you know, who will coordinate all this, that is, I think, yet to be done. And hopefully it will be done sometime. So thank you all for being part of this uh, session. It's an informal discussion, and that's the richness that we don't try to push any one solution or idea. And I would like to thank you all, Rohit Kakkar, Professor Mona, um, uh, Ajit, Pratima, and Jagan, and of course, Manas. So thank you all for being here today. And we will, of course, share the recording as well as all the presentations with those people who had registered. So we will share that. And if you can send uh, your PDF presentations, Ajit and others, that we will, Ajit has sent, I think. And uh, Rohit Ji, if you can send, then we will share it with the others. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Dipadir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a very long day.